Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Il ah, y, y a du monde. Euh, bon, C'est un grand plaisir d'être ce soir ici au Centre d'art contemporain. Je n'ai pas vu Andrea Bellini, mais on le remercie. Si près de la société de physique. Euh, pour la présentation, la présentation de, de Cassandre euh, Poirier-Simon, qui a effectué un séjour au CERN, j'ai compris, de novembre 2016 à, 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 à janvier 2017, et qui avait comme partenaire Maria, donc je me réjouis de les entendre tout à l'heure. Je pense que Cassandre elle a gagné le prix Collide de Genève. Ce prix, pour moi, il illustre, il met à l'honneur la ville et le canton de Genève en tant que haut lieu de l'art et de la science. Il est bien en ligne avec le rôle que Genève a joué dans la création du CERN, pour la création d'attirer le CERN sur son sol, et depuis 63 ans maintenant, avec le lien avec le CERN. CERN, c'est une organisation internationale, 22 États membres, au service de 13 000 utilisateurs qui viennent du monde entier, mais c'est aussi ancré dans le territoire, sur le canton de Genève, la ville de Genève et la France voisine, l'un à l'autre Savoie. Et ça, on tient beaucoup à cet ancrage ici dans le territoire. Pour moi, c'est une belle illustration, ce prix, du partenariat culturel que le CERN a établi avec la ville et le canton de Genève. Et on voit que c'est la quatrième fois que ce prix est financé par la ville et le canton. Il est attribué depuis, depuis tous les deux ans, depuis 2010. Je crois que Collide, c'est un programme, le programme phare du CERN dans le domaine artistique. Euh, je remercie encore une fois la ville, le canton et la ville euh, qui financent la résidence d'artistes euh, qui vivent dans le canton au CERN. Alors vous allez vous me demander, moi je suis directeur des accélérateurs de la technologie, vous pouvez me demander qu'est-ce que je fais ici à introduire une, une soirée de, de, de cet ordre. Ben parce que je pense que moi la physique des particules et ces technologies, technologies indispensables à construire nos grands instruments, que sont les accélérateurs, les détecteurs et les grands com computeurs, eh bien, c'est la, la, la physique et, et l'art euh, à la même curiosité, pardon, à la même curiosité de comprendre les lois de la nature et de l'univers que l'art. Je pense que comme il n'y a pas de découverte scientifique sans technologie, il n'y a pas d'art sans techniques, même si l'art et la science ne sont, sont pas seulement réduits à des techniques. Il y a d'autres dimensions, et pour moi, c'est la conscience, la conscience humaine. J'aime bien la phrase, la phrase de Paul Klee qui écrivait que l'art L'art ne reproduit pas le visible, il le rend visible. Que fait la science si ce n'est de rendre visible la réalité des constituants intimes de la matière, que sont aussi bien l'infiniment petit que l'infiniment grand Et je pense qu'on procède aussi avec une même démarche analogue aux différentes phases de création, l'observation, le questionnement, l'expérimentation, l'itération, l'expression et la communication. Et je pense que ce soir, on va être au stade de la communication. Dans cette démarche, pour moi, aussi bien scientifique, et je pense de l'art, ce qui est important, c'est la rencontre, la confrontation, et même souvent le conflit. On peut aller jusqu'au conflit. Pardon. Je pense que ce qui rend intéressant les sciences et l'art, et ce que j'aime bien dans le programme Art Art CERN, c'est qu'il provoque cette confrontation entre ces deux disciplines. Ça, c'est encore, encore mieux. Les lois de la physique nous imposent de grands instruments pour sonder des petites dimensions. Donc c'est-à-dire que plus on veut voir petit, nous, plus il faut penser, il faut construire grand. Je pense que c'est la même chose pour l'art. Il nous faut des grands projets artistiques, des grandes initiatives culturelles pour appréhender, appréhender l'intime de l'humain. Et je pense que c'est encore une fois penser grand pour euh, faire les choses. Pour terminer, je voudrais revenir à, à Cassandre. La semaine dernière, pour préparer cette réunion, j'ai pris un grand plaisir à parcourir, parcourir votre blog et les 20 postes que vous avez faits pendant votre séjour. Alors déjà, de, tout début, j'ai eu un choc, parce que CPS CERN. CPS, je ne sais pas si vous le savez, hein, c'est un étonnement, parce que c'est CPS, ça veut dire CERN, Proton, Synchrotron. Et c'est le, le premier euh, synchrotron de 600 mètres de circonférence, qui a été mis en, qui a, le CERN a été créé pour construire ce CPS. C'est pas beau comme clin d'œil, ça Et il a été mis en fonctionnement en 59, il est toujours en opération, et un des piliers pour remplir l'injecteur, pour remplir le, 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 le LHC, et il va fonctionner au moins jusqu'à 2035-2040. Donc je pense que quand j'ai vu CPS à CERN, je me suis dit, tiens. J'ai pu constater qu'en trois mois, vous avez rencontré de nombreuses personnes que je connais bien, comme Tiziano Camporesi à CMS, Anita Ollier aux archives, juste en dessous de mon bureau. C'est dommage que vous n'avez pas monté jusqu'au cinquième étage. Euh, Reyes à la salle de contrôle, qui est le cerveau des accélérateurs. Même un théoricien, Gavier Salam, visiter la bibliothèque, la salle de contrôle d'AMS. 
pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas, c'est un détecteur qui est situé sur l'ISS et qui est contrôlé au CERN, à des Aegis, qui est une expérience où on est en train de regarder si un anti euh, atome d'hydrogène, il monte ou descend à la gravité. On ne sait toujours pas si un anti atome monte ou descend à la gravité. Donc des problèmes intéressants qui se regardent. Assister à une conférence sur l'accélérateur la, à, à Glaé du, du Douvre, visiter l'atelier mécanique principal, même rencontrer Women in Technology, je, 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 je suis appris, animer un, un atelier d'écriture digitale, et bien sûr, avec Maria, le centre de calcul. Et je même vu, je vous ai même vu construire une chambre à brouillard. Je peux dire que je suis ébobi qu'en trois mois, vous n'ayez plus faire tout ça. Je suis dit bra bravo, et je me suis vraiment impatient d'entendre vos présentations, ainsi que les impressions de Maria de cette expérience. Un grand plaisir, et je vous remercie, et je voudrais passer la parole au canton. Alors, je vais essayer l'office cantonal de la culture et du sport. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Merci à M. Bordry pour cette inspirante introduction. Merci aussi à Julianne et à Monica pour cette organisation. Donc, c'est avec grand plaisir et beaucoup d'intérêt que la ville et le canton de Genève se sont une nouvelle fois associés au CERN pour ce projet. Et euh, nous étions particulièrement, enfin j'étais particulièrement euh, intéressée par cette proposition de travailler sur le livre, sur l'écriture, sur la littérature, donc après euh, le cinéma, la danse et la musique, euh, dans la mesure où se, se posent aujourd'hui au livre et à l'écriture des défis très importants dans le domaine du numérique euh, et pour lesquels nous avons vraiment besoin euh, de compétences, de recherche, d'exploration et pour cela de conditions euh, idéal d'ailleurs au CERN euh, pour cette expérimentation donc euh, merci infiniment au CERN d'avoir offert ce véritable laboratoire euh, à Cassandre euh, pour euh, y développer ce projet j'étais particulièrement touchée par vos paroles sur l'infiniment grand, l'infiniment petit parce que je pense que le défi est infiniment grand mais si on ne commence pas par des projets euh, vraiment précis et euh, effectivement petit, euh, on n'ira nulle part. Et donc, euh, simultanément à, au lancement de cette bourse, donc en 2015, on a créé euh, aussi Ville et Canton de Genève une bourse de, pour l'écriture numérique, euh, donc euh, sans ces conditions idéales de laboratoire, mais par contre qui est ouverte, qui va continuer donc, tous les deux ans. Le premier euh, lauréat était euh, dans le domaine de la bande dessinée, avec un projet aussi très intéressant. Donc, euh, si parmi vous, il y a des personnes qui sont intéressées à postuler, donc vous trouvez tous les détails sur cette bourse, sur les sites de la ville et du canton. Je fais un peu de publicité, mais ce n'est pas pour rien. C'est parce qu'aujourd'hui, on, on a vraiment aussi besoin de, de toucher des personnes intéressées. Et finalement, il y a encore peu de gens qui connaissent l'existence de cette bourse. Voilà. Donc, je vais tout de suite passer la parole à mon collègue, mais vous dire encore que nous sommes ravis aussi de poursuivre cette aventure avec vous à partir de 2018 dans d'autres domaines. Voilà, donc je passe la parole à André Valdis euh, de la ville de Genève, service culturel. Bonsoir, alors je m'associe évidemment à tout ce qui vient d'être dit et la, la ville de Genève est particulièrement heureuse de s'associer à ce, à, ce, à ce partenariat avec le, le CERN et le canton pour plusieurs raisons, parce qu'évidemment, le CERN, par ce qui s'y fait, est évidemment très inspirant, par les gens qui y travaillent aussi, mais aussi pour une, pour une autre raison, c'est que ça donne l'occasion à des artistes dans des domaines très divers. On a commencé par la, par la danse en 2012, avec Gilles Jobin. Euh, ça donne la possibilité aux artistes de, de faire un travail, pas nécessairement avec une nécessité de résultats, de produits finis, mais de faire, je ne suis pas en train de faire des jeux de mots et des analogies un peu faciles entre la, la science et, le, et les arts, mais faire de la recherche, faire de la recherche pure, de la recherche fondamentale, avec des, des possibilités d'erreur, avec euh, voilà, de, de l'expérimentation. Et aujourd'hui, c'est de plus en plus difficile à défendre cet aspect-là du, du travail artistique, parce que les, les crédits culturels euh, eh bien, sont sont mises à mal un peu partout, chez nous aussi à Genève, pas seulement, euh, pas seulement aux états unis euh, Et euh, voilà, le, quand on subventionne un spectacle, quand on subventionne une pièce de théâtre, un, un opéra, un, un disque, on a un produit fini, on a quelque chose qu'on peut défendre, mais l'expérimentation avec... Euh, 
quelque chose qui ne soit pas vraiment compris, c'est un privilège, c'est quelque chose de très important. C'est comme ça que les artistes avancent, c'est comme ça qu'ils qu peuvent évoluer dans leur travail, trouver de nouvelles idées et puis regarder vers le futur. Alors pour nous, l'instrument qui permet de, de, de développer ça, c'est l'instrument des bourses. Certaines sont partagées avec le, avec le canton, comme vient de le dire Claire et Dallier. D'autres, nous les poursuivons seuls. Il y a, des, seuls, il y a, des, il y a des, des bourses de résidence aussi, des bourses de, de, de création. Et celle avec le CERN, évidemment, nous, nous plaît particulièrement parce que, je l'ai dit, c'est un, un, un univers particulièrement inspirant avec une formule de mentorat, de partenariat, de personnes qui travaillent ensemble, etc. Donc voilà, nous sommes prêt à continuer évidemment sur cette lancée et on m'a donné deux minutes je les ai déjà dépassées alors merci beaucoup et puis on se réjouit d'entendre la suite et c'est la, la formule de la soirée je vais passer la, la parole à Monique Abello head, head, head of something at arts at CERN merci Hello. Well, another thank you. It's uh, great. Uh, it's great to have you here uh, tonight. Is uh, uh, we invite you to come to Geneva to celebrate what we've been doing for the last three months, four, five. Sometimes the period of the residency is three months, but sometimes it's prolonged. So it's very, very flexible and fluid process. Uh, I wanted to invite you here because uh, to tell you about this process, what we do, uh, how we do it, and what is the reason behind. Uh, Art Satsang started in 2011, and since the beginning, we understood that it was very important to make collaborations and partnerships with uh, uh, key uh, partners in the region and as well as internationally. And I uh, take the chance to thank you, the Canton and La Ville, for being with us for the fourth edition now. And uh, it's one of the, the first partner, uh, partnerships we had. Um, in this occasion, Collage Geneva was dedicated to, uh, to digital literature. And uh, we also take the chance each edition to uh, see what is happening in the cultural scene of, the, of Geneva. And uh, we were advised, and uh, we conclude was a good, and that was a good framework to set up a residency at CERN because of the uh, for many reasons, but there is an obvious one, because there is a huge connection of CERN with the developments and massive achievements in computing in the last 28 years, <laughs> for instance. So we are here today to uh, say goodbye, by, but hello to Cassandra Boresimon, who was, uh, you've been working with us for three months be between November and January. Uh, and with Maria Dimu as scientific partner. Uh, Cassandra, you are a writer, designer, and your uh, activities are very plural. It's a wide range of activities that uh, gives you the chance to diversify the way of storytelling, writing, researching, and exploring through time, space, memory, uh, and this is what uh, I'm pleased to say that you've been doing at your time at CERN. Uh, in our residencies, it's very important, the interaction with the scientists, and the, the scientists and the artists are close together in conversation. We don't uh, go so far as collaboration, but sometimes happen, and it's very gratifying to see it. Uh, the collaboration with Maria has been clear. You've been guided and curated by your scientific partner, and I think uh, this is something I'd like to take to the questions later. And, uh, and, um, but also you saw many other scientists and experiments, and i like to hear about it and to share later in the conversation. So I'll just pass you the microphone and... Uh, the, the stage is yours. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for being here. Um, 
I am Cassandra Simon, an independent interaction designer here in Geneva. Uh, MITEN, MIT Numérique, so digital myth in French, is a digital communication agency I founded. MITEN specializes in uh, narrations and digital experiences, and I work with cultural and educational institutions or businesses to help them tell their stories. So I work in different teams depending on the project. I write the story, construct the universes, or adapt clients' stories to a digital experience. <coughs> and I am particularly interested in the shape stories can take. This shape is linked to our understanding of the world, of the world structure. Where are the stories? They are, for example, in books. At the scale of the book object, the reading system is linear. We read line by line, page by page. They can also be on TV, where they are globally perceived linearly also, or in cinema, and etc. cetera. Uh, the stories can also be in discussions. They are built up gradually, so they are a little bit more interactive. And narrative images can, however, be perceived in a more scattered or disseminated manner. But in any case, it is difficult to get out of the linearity of perception. Now, for the content aspect, how do we get out of the linear arrow of time? As we read or look, the actions are combined one with another. There is the before, the now, the after. Initial situation, disruptive element, adventure, resolution, and outcome. But when we tell a story, we also insert our memories or our desires, flashbacks, imaginary futures. The authors play with this arrow of time, displaying actions at different times. And digital media, which are interactive and hybrid, meaning they mix different media, are the perfect vehicle for non-linearity. Let's take the example of a tool similar to the book as the stories container, which you know and which can be read digitally. So in a web browser, we can open several tabs between which we jump. Each of these tabs is a world in itself. Let's take a web page 2000 pixels high, for example, we will not read each item of text that is on it. We can also click on a link and be transported elsewhere before finishing. This web page can also be viewed in two minutes if there is only text, or in 20 if there is a video, or if text elements open between the lines, pop over, etc. The tablet has a relationship with the landscape. It is a framework on a larger space. In this, it has much more logical relation to the image than with the text. When I came to CERN, I wanted to have another approach to the space-time structure. I wanted to apprehend his space, to map stories into it, something more fluid and unexpected than the page after page or even tangible structure. We are in digital space. So what do we learn from the world and from human relationships if by stretching out the finger we reach a parallel universe or if our fingertips have already disappeared in the number of years, if temporality disintegrates? I will now illustrate my point in a peculiar way through three projects of mine, Luna's Hearth, the Road Companion, and Wrist Roach. It will be a little bit like an experiment in Google Street View, and you'll then understand why. So let's begin with a book, but a digital one. We start our journey in China, where the first book of Luna's Hearth takes place. Luna and her grandfather are traveling around the world in scientific expeditions inspired by expeditions that really occurred. The first is set in China, where the grandfather goes on an expedition to see the last remaining river dolphins on the Yangtze, and that's why we are here, near the river. 
Luna's Health is a saga for teenagers about the environment published in paper and digital formats. The app shows Luna's universe through a series of continents, each representing a volume of the series and reproducing the country where the story takes place. So the different chapters are located on the map of the continent. <coughs> so when reading one of the book, the user zooms into the corresponding continent and can follow Luna's adventures. So the structure shown of this story is linear, but seen from above. We advance zone by zone, and we don't see the micro shiftings, like this. So the next project is Le Compagnon de Route. So we are here in a little road in Drôme, where I grew up. Uh, Le Compagnon de Route, the road companion, is a story to be read online. And it is not really a road movie, but a road story. So you just need to print a windshield in paper and to glue it on your computer screen to transform it into a car. Then you can navigate into the story with the arrows on your keyboard. So I will show you how I do. So for example, there is a crossroads, and you choose which way you want to drive. <coughs> Like in a video game, we'll go on the roads with the driver and his companion to pick up flowers, like little treasures. The fact of choosing paths will not allow us to change the story, but more to understand differently the relationship between the two people in the car, depending on the information we'll get. This web project has been exhibited the first time as a website in the National Library of France in 2015 during a conference about digital literature. And the second time it has been exhibited here. It's in the center of contemporary arts as an installation. So this story is the literal representation of what a hyperfiction is. So you know the choose your own adventure books? This is the same structure with branch lines. So for example, we had this way. But maybe if we are, if we are in Zurich, we want to go to Stuttgart, to Munich, and etc. We can go like this. And from Geneva to Turin, Milan, Venice, and maybe all the, all the roads end at the same point. The third project I want to show you is Restwatch. So here we are in Basel World, in Basel. Uh, it was a project for Tissot. Uh, they wanted a display to show their T-Touch digital watches. So the one I proposed and was exhibited in 2012 uh, consisted in a series of four terminals arranged like quartz, and I will show you the video. So they were open to the public, and visitors were encouraged to put their hands in each terminal as a mimic of the gesture of looking at their watch. By inserting their hand in the terminal, visitors triggered the appearance of a miniature world that clung around the wrists. So there were different worlds for the sea touch, sailing touch, racing touch, tea touch experts, and with different stories on them. So here the world is reduced to a sphere, like this one. We trigger the stories and we watch them interacting together. So, as you know, I have been awarded the Atatian Award for Digital Literature 
and spent three months as an in artist in residence at CERN. So when I came here, my first idea was, in short, to develop a digital book that translates physicists' understanding of time and space to both its story and navigation system. For example, a book that is in perpetual expansion. We begin from a little room, then other rooms and characters appear, etc. It could be also a book that contains no pages, but another form of basic structure. So, what would be the elementary element of a book? The page, the word, the letter, the ink, or maybe the sounds, or even the meaning, the ideas. It could also be a story where sometimes you can follow an event lasting one second, then an event lasting a thousand years, and where you can zoom in and out of space and time. Once upon a time, there was a princess, then she dies. You can follow during several paragraphs the water in a glass warmed by the sun, then in one line an entire dynasty has gone extinct. So the residency was about meeting people, speaking and exploring the experiences. At the beginning, I thought, I thought it would have been difficult to come to CERN for nearly three months without producing anything from what I was learning. Fortunately, I was asked to run a blog, so it's here, cps.cern.adavist.com. So I was able to react to some of the inputs there. And soon came the idea of doing something at CERN. First, to have an exchange and propose something of my own to them. And secondly, to have a longer discussion with scientists as a brainstorming around a precise subject. That's why a writing workshop came to my mind, to pick up impressions, ideas, and space-time representations from the scientists. And I also wanted to propose my vision of writing, which is writing for a specific context and a specific device. You are not writing only text. There is also the reading experience. But what tool could I furnish? I then began to explore the sun. The spaces there were like theaters for me. And then Clara Dambourlarius, who is here in the room also, it's a, she's a physicist working at CERN, she told me that the Google Street car spent time in CERN photographing the places. I began wondering what it would be like to tell stories or create visits in this space. I met Jean-Yves Lemaire to gain more input on the Invenio software that runs the CERN document server and that interests me because all the grey literature of the CERN is there. He told me that there was an APA and also a lot of archive pictures of the CERN. So they could really be injected in Google Street View. I spoke also with Maximilien Bries, who took care of the Google Car team in CERN and explained to me how they did it and how the project developed further. A similar tool has been included in the GIS portal, which is the CERN internal cartographic system. But the, so it's here. But the more usable tool in the short term was Google Street View, because yeah, it has an API ready, and also the public can see it, while the GIS is restricted to people inside CERN. So the workshop, it was called Thinking Elise. Uh, so I'm more accustomed to longer watch workshops, but here the two times three hours duration that I wanted to propose was too much commitment, so we reduced this to two hours. There were 12 participants, and they worked in three people teams. I proposed that they use Google Street View as a playground where they'll place their stories. Since we didn't have much time, I asked them to jump on the first idea they had. So I will now present you the four projects. Past building blocks of the future. So the team was composed by Tamara Vasquez Schroeder, Melissa Gaillard, and Nicole Kremel. As I will read you the, the note written by Tamara. So, the physics that can be done nowadays at CERN is only conceivable 
thanks to the gigantic breakthroughs that previous scientists have made in the understanding of nature. CERN celebrates the work from our predecessors, naming various streets inside of CERN after scientists that have left their impact in the history of particle physics. So for example, here we are in the street named Polly, so it's here. With this project based on Google Maps, the virtual visitor is greeted from entrance B to restaurant one, meeting the outstanding personalities from the past that are remembered by the street names from different times and different places, all related to particle physics as in a multidimensional puzzle. So hi there, I'm Wolfgang Poli. I postulated the existence of the neutrino. Neutrino goes through the Atlas detector without being seen. So there is several personalities like this. Oops, where did I go? And etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, <coughs> so another project. Uh, this project has been done by by Jeremy Niedzela, Natalia Karina Yuska, Stephen Goldfarb, and Maria Dimu. Their idea was to create a visit of the CERN in 2017 by visitors from the future. So they wrote a dialogue between us, the physicists from the future, and them, CERN worker from 2017. So for, for example, welcome to CERN. Are you here for a visit? Well, we've been here already. What year are we in? 2017, Why, what kind of question is this? Is CERN a particle physics lab still? Yes, what did you expect? Well, we finished with particle physics around 2165. What do you mean by that? We figured it all out, but you'll get there. So. Show us an experiment. I suggest you go across the street to the globe and meet my friend who will show you Atlas. OK, see you soon. And then we continue. So we learn a lot of interesting things. <laughs> and also that uh, Alice discovered via their research in the gluon plasma the explanation of dark matter and dark energy. This is called the Wright rabbit discovery because it's Alice, <laughs> that allows for reaching places through teleportation, so into the rabbit holes. The third project has been done by Heather Gray, Kitty Lay, and Anna Short. So I will show you a video demo they have, been, they have done. So they said, our final idea was to collect pieces around CERN, which lead us to a physics theme. The idea behind it is to have an interactive and entertaining approach to capture interests. To do that, we collected our ideas together and added maps with clues on these places. So we see all the places, the globe, the coffees, the bigger, biggest detector, so atlas, the bubble chamber, and etc. So it's like a treasure, treasure hunting game. And the fourth and last project, is uh, like timelines <coughs> mapped in space. Uh, it's, name, it's named the uh, early days, no, the early years. So uh, it's, uh, this team is represented by Maria <laughs> Alandez Pradillo, Gavin Salam, and Yuri Tanaka. <coughs> they focused on the localization of timelines in space as a real space-time entanglement. So I read their text. Our idea was to represent in Google Street View the different timelines that appear in the CERN web. We started with the accelerator timeline. Our idea was to have a picture of the director general at the time at CERN next to the relevant building where the information would be presented. It may be a direct answer to a question I asked at the beginning. How can we build a map by integrating the notion of time? So it was a very short but interesting workshop 
and I'm glad to have received positive feedbacks from the participants. For the moment, what we have done is really embryonic, but I am sure we can create a much more developed tool in Google Street View for outreach, but also for real poetry and stories in it. To finish, and at the same time continue with this idea of opening spaces like accordions and conduct research on various media that could possibly tell stories, I was very interested in the system of writing equations. Indeed, they are not read linearly, so I will therefore continue to study how they are structured, like a media. And uh, perhaps to be inspired for other forms of narrative structures. So I even found a choose your own listen books around uh, algebra by chance in the CERN library. It's from 1960s. And it's really like a, yeah, like a choose your own adventure book. You, 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 may, you may see it after. <laughs> So let me now present Maria Dimu. She was one of the workshop participants, but she was also from the other side. I had the chance to have her as my scientific partner, and she helped me a lot to organize the workshop and to meet the people I wanted to speak with. We saw each other every week of my residency. She has been working for many years on the worldwide LHC computing grid, and at the beginning I was very interested also by the near data deluge and all the consequences it would imply. She also helped evangelize this crazy thing that is the volunteer computing via short technical videos in her IT e-learning project, but she will tell you more about all of this. CERN is about uh, research. It has four missions, as we have de de uh, defined them recently. And uh, our director has pronounced them very clearly. So this is a, a nice picture that is made to show how an accelerator, which is in a tunnel, a uh, hundred meters under the earth in the Pays de Jax, and uh, the, a, a picture, you know, artificial picture of the sky can match together with the notion of what uh, Frederick said at the beginning of research spanning from the very, very small particles to the infinitely great galaxies. And the reason actually why um, I wanted very much to make this uh, metaphor, let's say, is that it seems unrelated to have very concrete, very precise, always provable, or very discrete, if not yet proved, uh, speech by science, and yet have so many um, free and innovative and flexible modes of taking every kind of material and the speech and image to make an artistic work. So first basic mission of CERN is to do fundamental research. Then it's to research in the areas of technology, and the reason is that one cannot accelerate the protons that we accelerate today in the current experiment without having incredible level of engineering, uh, magnet knowledge in depth, uh, cryogenics, and computing. So as I work in computing, and this Cassandra's, uh, one of the pre preferred colors is a fuchsia kind of pink. I framed our computing center in pink. Uh, but uh, in diversity, we have a long way to go. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are working on this. So the computer center looks like this now. It was built in 72, and at that time we were thinking that a, uh, 1,000 square meter room with very high ceiling is good enough for cooling and operating the computers, which were antique 
museum pieces, main frames in today's um, technology. But now that we have uh, thousands of uh, small computers looking like pizza boxes, but with uh, many uh, cores, many uh, calculation units that give out a lot of heat, in there it's like a sauna. In the 90s, it was super cold, and to work on the consoles without having the fingers purple, we, you had to be Russian. But today, you just cannot enter in there because it's infinitely cold, hot and noisy. So, third mission of CERN is collaboration, and this is probably one of the most rewarding things about working there because you can find Nobel Prizes that are always available. You have a question, you just... Cassandra wanted to, to discover something or know something in depth. We could find the person, he was or she always delighted to talk. I'm sure, and she mentioned it. So this is a picture of great enthusiasm what happened in this case? We had the, the Le Faisceau, we had the beam the aligned correctly. So you can see there very carefully the, the, the de how delighted people are. You can also count the number of women on the picture, but passons. Uh, and about collaboration, I really have a second slide because I'm so enthusiastic about it. Look at this picture of the planet. With the exception of very few uh, African countries, Greenland and uh, I don't know, what is it, uh, um, Indonesia? I'm not sure about my geography, despite the Google Earth view that we did uh, in depth. Uh, everybody in the planet participates. The member states are the deep blue, but uh, the observers are the light blue. And you had, um, in the Cold War era, you had collaboration despite the Cold War where uh, Americans and Russians were sitting in the same meeting room discussing their experiment. It's just, this is kind of miracle. And the last mission of CERN is about education. And this is what gives all this youth and innovation and the students who come and work with us and uh, the new ideas they bring and the, the new things they take back about not only what physics is at CERN and what computing is at CERN and what engineering is at CERN, but also about how people can work together and have to totally, totally different cultures nevertheless. So CERN, because it's so international, because it's all over the world, had from the beginning the need for intense networking. So when I came to CERN at the end of the 80s, we had a lot of network protocols. And there was a kind of protocols war, because at that time, there were standardization bodies that were close to the governments, to the PTTs, to uh, telecommunications authorities that wanted to impose um, protocols of establishing networks between research uh, institutes, but also every industrial computer company had their own network. So I worked on software that was trying to um, convert from one protocol to the other the packets so that we could communicate because my application of which I was responsible for was the email. And at that time, every such protocol had a different email format. So um, much before my time in the 70s, uh, Vint Cerf and other guys in the States who were students then, and Vint Cerf is not a person of CERN, but he is kind of my mentor, and he has been to CERN a few times, 
um, he will come again, I hope. Um, and they invented internet. So you can see on this graph that he provided that at the beginning of the internet, there was a track. I have a photo of, of this track. If you go to my homepage at CERN, you can see it in one of the previous presentations. There was a track that had to travel from one internet node to the other so that this is a track so that it can make sure that the packets can get to the destination. It was very uh, elementary stuff. So uh, in 89, uh, between 89 and 91, our colleague at CERN who was in IT, uh, we were working very close together, not on the same project, uh, had written this proposal that is now on every t-shirt, like uh, the Che Guevara photo, um, where he suggested that we no more send the scientific publications to all collaborating institutes by post, because this is something that we cannot remember if we are old enough, or we cannot conceive if we are very young. But at the time, up to the 80s included, certain collaborations who, which were comprised by hundreds of people required the papers to be sent to every member institute, to be corrected by the, the, the collaborators, and then commonly edited. Right? You agree? He agrees? He knows? So this uh, person, uh, fantastically humble and able to distinguish what is important with what is rubbish. He sat down and, as a single man, wrote the protocol HTTP, the language HTML inspired from uh, HTML, which was a markup language, and um, went to distribute the first server and client software for the web. And I remember, I remember the time he said when, um, when uh, only the first web server at CERN was hardly configured that he doesn't want to be rich, he wants to be famous. So some dreams come true. So then after we went, all, we understood that computing is necessary because the experiments get larger and larger as the machine has to be more and more complex for its construction and operation, we had to make a projects that strip for the physicist, uh, the, from the physicist's souci, worry, the difficulty of understanding all under, underlying tools for reading events, displaying them on their computer, event is in our jargon the result of a collision. So we had th hundreds, many hundreds of people collaborated in writing what we call the grid middleware. What is, why did we call this project grid? Because we hoped it will be like the plug on the wall where you can plug a toaster or you can plug a computer or any device. And the grid would be like the electric grid of the city where you don't care how it got to the plug. So we are not uh, as plug and play because it's a complex kind of middleware, a complex layer. But still, what happens is true that there are uh, hundreds of collaborating institutes and universities they are in a hierarchy depending on how much they can contribute in terms of uh, computer center availability and complexity. And you have at any moment many, many hundreds of thousands of jobs, of programs run simultaneously in the world thanks to this uh, grid software. So that all, that story of the internet, the web, and the grid was just to explain that um, somebody who is um, recycled, like me, from a physicist into an IT person, 
does not do IT in the way that um, an IBM IT person does it. I mentioned IBM because I worked there right after university. So there are experiments and there are challenges for the people in uh, um, CERN experiments and IT that are very complicated. For example, with RAN2, now that we start again taking data real soon now, we expect to have 40 billion billion bytes per year. And I was looking for an analogy from other, from other aspects of our life. All the written works that mankind ever published from the beginning of uh, written works existing is uh, a bit more than this. So there are also all these aspects that Cassandra mentioned. The data preservation, what do we do with data that we knew how to handle in the 80s and now the computers, the tapes, the disks, the programs, the programming languages no more exist. Uh, documentation, digital libraries, software we develop for other projects to put their data on. And uh, all of the aspects of education, which uh, are one of our four missions and which are very dear to my heart, hence interest very much in the Arts at CERN project, responsibility in academic training and in e-learning. So why from the beginning of this project, as Monica said, 2011, I was very, very uh, uh, interested in being involved and participating at the times that I could be useful. Because I really believe that art makes life worth living. Because via art, I think we can discover beauty. Whereas science makes us live free. Because only with science and applying logic and uh, requiring proof, we can, not, we can be free from swallowing any rubbish propaganda that can be thrown at us. Uh, I also was reading recently, I don't know the author, I saw her books after I read the clause, that a creative adult is a child who survived. And I believe this because uh, when we have been uh, restricted and re, re 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 restricted so many for decades in our lives, uh, we have our wings of creativity chopped. And from that point of view, Complex discoveries for us as scientists require the creativity that the artists allow themselves to, to live with and deploy every day of their life. So there is a complementarity that we absolutely need. And uh, in the discussions we had with um, Cassandra, in things I have observed before with the dancers, we are so analytic. Sometimes it takes so long to understand all possible parameters of a situation. And the, and the artists are so synthetic. It's like a super powerful vacuum cleaner. I mean, you, you give their five elements they have absorbed them, and they have made something new out of them. It's, it's admirable. So, and with my other work and role with uh, academic training at CERN, for example, I have seen other disciplines, in addition to physics, in addition to co computing, and in addition to the branches of art that uh, I, I managed to come across with. with it's not possible today for things as complex as the origin of dark matter that we can advance only by sticking into the way we can think in our discipline. It's not possible. Because as um, the preface of one programming book, the C++ uh, Bible, which is a programming language we use a lot, says language determines what you can think of. 
And I believe this is true and it's believe, believe, I believe it applies to the branch of every profession. We can think of several alternatives if we know physics very well, but we need these other points of view to advance in unknown areas. And uh, as a proof of that, I'm not going to quote Paul Klee because Freddie already did it. But I didn't send him the slides, nor did he send me my, his speech. So you see that we all agree there. The, the, the story of the beauties in the eye of the beholder uh, is what, so, what I want to show next. You will have the possibility to look at Cassandra's block offline. It, it was mentioned here twice already. But I just want to show you some of the pictures here so that you can see how we at CERN were always saying, well, c'est moche, mais on s'y est habitué, sort of patience. Where else? Cassandra came at Christmas and took uh, some photos, and you look at them and you are ému, <laughs> you are sort of moved because they contain worlds within the simple photographed item. Uh, you can see things that are there from reflection in the grass. You can see a ladder that goes to heaven and it's sort of, it's sort of like, for me it was like a, a, a picture that shows the devotion of most people who work there. Of course, it's like every other workplace in the earth. There are all kinds of people, but there is such a majority of devotion to the projects that it's sort of sublimination de la de l'environnement. So you can see several of them where you, you have the impression that it's like the end of the world as we know it, and there is one item left there, almost hanging in the air. You have this petite crèche de Noël uh, in the middle of the Geneva winter. Um, you have the top of the hill and you don't know what is beyond and you can imagine several things. Uh, this one reminded me a, a lot of P Peter Doyle, an artist that was exposed in the Bejeler in Basel, Basel last year. So. I work at CERN so many years, I never noticed all these things are so beautiful. And this is the last one, which was also when the lab was closed and 2016 was ending and it was written with, by somebody, or it was you? No. Somebody, we don't know, uh, on, the, on the window. I think it's, you can see how an artist can bring out beauty of the things we see and we just don't know. So, merci. Really inspiring and amazing presentations and remarks about uh, the work you've been doing at CERN. And uh, as well as the history, it's really nice to see this timeline, how the thinking progresses and evolves in, in collaborations. So um, this is how we are going to do it. I'm going to throw you a couple of questions each. <laughs> and, and then I'll invite the public to, to comment or to uh, give some questions and answers to the artists and scientists here. And uh, my first question is for you, Cassandra. I've seen that uh, you've been articulating many different languages here, the visual, the, um, even you can hear sound in your pictures as well as in the exercise you did with Google Street View. You, you can see experience happening. So how was your experience in your time at, during the residency? I bet that there are associations of ideas that you didn't expect when you talk to different scientists 
not only from IT as Maria, you saw each other regularly, but also you, you, you know about the now about the diversity of fields and uh, so genres at CERN. So, what uh, associations, uh, unexpected associations, you saw during your time and your visits to different people? Yeah, and the, there is nobody on my pictures, but uh, <laughs> however, I met a lot of people, and it's <laughs> what I, I remember of the CERN. <laughs> and yeah, we, we, we talked a lot, and they were very available. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time with, with, a, with a lot of people at CERN. And, um, and yes, there were a lot of uh, associations that I didn't expect. Um, I think that each thing that I was told uh, was generating a new idea. <laughs> so um, I have a big list of all ideas uh, of things I want to do <laughs> after CERN. But then I, I have to, to, to select things uh, regarding my thematic of research. So um, yeah, and also um, we, we, we talked uh, also a, a bit uh, about equations because uh, I once in the library, because I spent a lot of time at the li library of CERN, uh, I saw an equation that really looked like a musical no notation. And I was like, how, how is this read? Uh, and maybe how is it like when you read it out loud? Or aloud, sorry. So I asked a friend of mine who studied mathematics to read me at, uh, to read me out loud, aloud, and it was not linear. He was jumping from the beginning and and taking some other information in the end of the equation, and I was like, but how do you read it? And I really wanted to 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 study it as if it was uh, media. So we speak also with Gavin Salam, and he told to us that they can be seen also as uh, images, maybe, because uh, you can jump into different parts of the equation. So I, I would like to continue working on this theme. So this is something there that it, it, there are just only one thing, uh, thing you would like to follow and or a thread, or do, do you have many ideas just jumping and going like, pick me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot. Uh, but of course, I will continue with the Google Street View tool that I uh, have uh, develop, developed during uh, my, or oh, after my residency. Uh, but also, I was interested in the CERN Accelerator Complex, which is also a, a map. And I wanted to map stories in it again. <laughs> And um, yes, I, I don't have uh, uh, all my list in the head, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Cartographies are there as a key, a key word for you, right? Cartographies, Cartography, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the geography of the space, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go with Maria because um, many things have been said and are still uh, there for discussion about art and science collaborations and um, or art and science encounter encounters. I like to think about encounters because there you have a chance uh, to, to find opportunities that are unexpected, as we said before. But uh, there is a question that I'm always asked uh, and uh, I don't have an answer yet because I think there is a multiplicity of answers. So I'll give this question to you. And this, uh, how do you see the process of engaging with artists uh, affect to your own research as a scientist? Do I need this? I do. Yes, yes we are. Okay, so um, I will try to paraphrase what I said before. I think everyone can th think the way he or she is used to by education, culture, language, the bit set in the brain. And 
these uh, encounters give us a totally different map of the world, not in the sense of cartography strictly only, but in the abstract notion of map of the world. It's another point of view. It is um, the possibility for us not to be so uh, so strict, so fanatic about um, the process, because you can see that the process is not divine. The process can be uh, different paths to get to a result. As scientists, we need to go to a result which is provable, which can be defended, which can be cross-checked by other collaborators or opponents, and, and we have to be proven right. In, uh, in, the, in a sense of uh, correctness. But these encounters give us the possibility to approach different, difficult problems from other points of view, and sometimes we gain, we gain time and we gain uh, um, arguments for, for getting where we want to get. You understand what I mean? So uh, do you mean that uh, opening up a process, like giving other angles that are not strictly... Uh, Procedural, the way yeah. we know, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, do you For see example, that in the you art? Have, you have a physicist, you have a mathematician. For them, the equation with an integral, uh, with a derivative, with whatever, it is uh, a key in a uh, college, I don't know when, in every country, th that you read it in a given way. And you don't have the possibility to appreciate the beauty of it, and you don't have the possibility to imagine that somebody will come and say, how do you actually read this from here? And how do you say dete first or integrate over blah to blah? And all of these things, when, for example, you as a physicist or a mathematician have to explain your equation, for example, you have to speak to, to school kids, or you have to to explain to an audience that it has not done the maths in advance for you. you. You learn how to defend what you have written there and convey its content in a different manner. You have to convey the content that is accurate, that is sound scientifically, but you can do it in a way that the audience is not falling asleep real soon now. Yes. Mm, that uh, takes me to research. Research is, is a, a word that, that we repeat ourselves. We are researching, investigating. It's obvious that um, scientists do that all the time. At CERN, you are researching, you, are, you have a methodology. There is a scientific methodology that you, you deal with. But in the arts, uh, in the last decades, we uh, listen to the research focus arts. So how do you see that you, in your own practice uh, as a researcher, investigator, before you said that you were going to miss to, to be more hands-on in three, uh, uh, three months residencies dedicated just for research? So how do you deal with with this dichotomy between research-based art and production-based art? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question for art because, uh, uh, well, research in arts, um, it's a big question. It's, uh, it's, uh, we, we are pr producing also, uh, we are researching by producing at the same time than researching by you know, looking for other people's projects or 
or th uh, reading theory uh, on our problematics. And um, yeah, also I I don't know why uh, or at what point we are focusing on one thematic, or because we are not asked. Uh, by anybody to research on a certain point, but then uh, it began to to be uh, like um, an obsession. I I want to work on a narrative structure, and uh, and then I see all the world <laughs> um, in this point of view, and I will then research uh, by proposing. Uh, some experimentations and some point of view of, on this and maybe to be implemented after on other projects uh, and uh, of course not only art project but interdisciplinary project so yeah briefly <laughs> i think we are running a bit out of time so i'll pass the microphone to the audience if you have any comments or questions remarks please Again. Julian has the microphone. Oui, on va parler français comme ça. Les anglophones ils peuvent améliorer leur français. Moi, je suis italien. Et bon, le rapport entre art et science dans le passé, c'était assez clair. Assez clair. Disons qu'il y a beaucoup de grands savants qui étaient artistes. Bon, on parle de Leonardo da Vinci. Peut-être, mais on peut aller aussi les philosophes qui étaient aussi scientifiques, mathématiques, Descartes, euh, Pascal, pour arriver jusqu'à Einstein qui était grand violon, pas grand violoniste, mais passion, passionné de violon. Et je trouve que malheureusement aujourd'hui, peut-être parce qu'on est en train de aller vers une spécialisation très poussée de la de la science, les scientifiques que je rencontre les ingénieurs, que je, des amis qui travaillent au CERN, ils sont très peu passionnés de l'art. Et c'est un peu dommage d'être si cloisonné, dire je suis un grand un scientifique, mais après, en dehors, bon, l'art, le théâtre, ça m'intéresse beaucoup moins. Et moi, je trouve que l'art et le théâtre et toutes ces, ces activités, ils peuvent développer dans son esprit et aider à la recherche. Alors, je ne sais pas c'est quoi votre expérience. Bon, vous êtes... Euh, <rire> effectivement, je pense que vous êtes euh, quelqu'un qui aime l'art et la science. Mais qu'est-ce que vous en pensez de vos collaborateurs ou des les gens que vous croisez dans votre milieu Est-ce qu'il y a les gens qui continuent à aimer l'art ou alors, en dehors de, de leur travail, ils deviennent des personnes qui sont terrestres, comme Moi, j'aime bien le football, mais après, <rire> sont moi des choses banales. Voilà. Alors, et il y a trois choses. D'abord, comme je disais tout à l'heure, au CERN, Freddy a dit qu'il y a 13 000 personnes qui sont enregistrées. Donc, il y a de tout. <coughs> et il y a aussi énormément de gens qui sont très investis et très grands amateurs, bien sûr, parce que le pro professionnel, par ma définition, c'est celui qui paye ses factures par ce qu'il fait. Donc, si nous payons nos factures en travaillant au CERN, on peut dire qu'on est grand amateur d'art, mais on ne peut pas dire qu'on est vraiment artiste investi professionnellement. Ce n'est pas ça qui paye les factures. Mais par exemple, jusqu'à notre directrice générale, aujourd'hui même, elle est une pianiste confirmée avec euh, italienne, comme lei, et donc elle est laureata du conservatorio supérieure, non so quale. Je veux dire, elle est vraiment une pianiste, une pianiste professionnelle. Et comme ça, des gens comme ça, j'en ai rencontré plusieurs dizaines au CERN. C'est vrai que moi, dans ma sphère d'influence, enfin de contact, je parle de dizaines. Mais c'est vrai que je ne connais pas 
euh, un échantillon de tous les 13 000 qui sont dans le répertoire du CERN. En plus, il faut aussi comprendre que, bien sûr, l'interdisciplinarité nous mènera à la nouvelle renaissance. Je l'ai mis aussi sur mon slide et je pense beaucoup à Leonardo et ses capacités multiples. Mais il est vrai qu'aujourd'hui, pour pouvoir faire de la science fondamentale à ce niveau, il n'y a pas euh, 18 heures par jour de travail. Il y a des jours, des nuits, des mois, des années. C'est acharné. Donc, à un certain moment, si les gens qui sont déjà très exigeants dans le niveau de performance qui exige de eux-mêmes pour leur travail n'ont plus le courage de, fait, de pratiquer un art à côté, je peux co comprendre. Moi, j'aime beaucoup la danse. Je fais de la danse au niveau amateur. Mais... Non, mais il, il, il fréquente. Je, je ne peux pas parler, comme je disais tout à l'heure, de 13 000 euh, membres du répertoire. Mais moi, dans la petite ville de Genève, je peux aller à aucun spectacle sans tomber sur un collègue. Donc, je peux vous dire qu'il fréquente, sincèrement. Il, il, il peut y avoir certains qui ne voient pas cet échange intime, ces encounters, comme Monica disait tout à l'heure, aussi indispensables que nous le voyons nous ici. Mais je ne peux pas, je ne peux pas croire que dans la grande ma majorité, la, la, les gens du CERN n'ont pas une participation au, au, à la vie culturelle quand même, sincèrement. Et je crois que c'est une chance, ça, ça aussi pour nous comme collègues, pour les sujets de débat, pour euh, les échanges, oui. Regardez seulement sur la page web du CERN, vous voyez des dizaines de clubs, des clubs qui sont tout à fait des volontaires, qui peuvent, OK, avoir un, un, un but scientifique du type euh, investigation de l'énergie solaire, mais il y a quand même des clubs artistiques sur la musique, sur la danse, sur le cinéma, un tas de trucs, vraiment, beaucoup. Another question? Hi. So that was really incredible, by the way. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to ask is you worked there for three months, and a lot of the time you were probably uh, trying to talk to physicists or getting these questions answered. Um, as a physicist working there, the thing I'd ask you is, what is the biggest difference between the way that we work and the way that you work? Um, the biggest difference, um, I, I don't know if I, if I really understood how you work, because <laughs> I had the impression by being at CERN that you were quite um, free as a person independent like me, free to go to conferences you want, free to work on things you want, but I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, maybe the, the, the biggest difference is in part what I said before, that uh, I, was, I was not asked to work on, on a certain problematic. However, uh, it is linked to uh, the context and to I, I think that uh, those days it is interesting to work on the narration and storytelling with the digital media because it's there and uh, it, uh, I, I, yeah, it, it, it's, um, it's a good thing to create with this and to not be di dictated uh, the, the contents So, um, I, I, yeah, I don't know if I have completely answered to your question. Um, I have to think more about this. I think she says she's more free than us. Mm. She's more free. 
She's equally dedicated, but she has the difficult task to find the idea out of the blue, where else we are led to investigate something and then we can uh, squeeze ourselves to find results, but we have a general direction. She's more free. But I think there is also a more separation uh, at CERN between the theory, the experimentalists, uh, the engineers, and uh, by being an artist, I have to, to not to know all of this, but I, I, I have to code, uh, to draw, to uh, read a lot of articles and think of it, to write papers on this the uh, thematic and yeah, maybe more pluridisciplinar at the, as well. Another question down there? Uh, hi, um, I'm a Master of Fine Arts students actually at the head. Um, I just want to join your discussions about uh, what's the difference between artist and scientist. To me, I feel like fundamentally, I don't think there's a big difference between the two. Because if we say artist has a freedom, as Cassandra said, we also have the limits in our domain, especially if you're a professional artist. There are art markets which already limit your choices of doing and uh, how you think. And uh, for scientists, you have the same problem. But if we say, um, artists got creativity, but I think scientists also have the creativity in your domain. So there was a German uh, artist and theorist, actually, uh, it's called um, Bayer. <laughs> can't exactly recall uh, his, his family name, but um, he once said, everybody, are, uh, everybody is artist. Doesn't mean everybody will do like theater, play, or you know, to, to paint, to, to draw, but it means we're all artists in our domain, in our, um, in our expertise. If, if you're a scientist, you're the artist in the science. And if you're a chef, you're, you're the artist in the, in the cooking. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so what I study actually, and also my classmate, we study social, uh, socially engaged art. What we're trying to do is really trying to kind of uh, unleash everybody's you know, these fundamental things, uh, um, a, a kind of unleash your artistic uh, nature, come out of your domain, and let's try to work together and see uh, what kind of knowledge we can build up based on these uh, uh, activities together. So, um, yeah, my, my, my take is there's no basically fundamental difference where we're just restrained by our social uh, conventions and expectations. But uh, maybe, maybe that's the point to have an artist to be at CERN. It's really to uh, remind everybody where everybody is artist. We're not just uh, where everybody is science, scientists as well. So <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll have to leave it here with this uh, big idea about being an artist, being. Uh, Supported by creativity and curiosity, which I think uh, resumes what art and science is all together. Uh, please bear with us. There is a drink reception to end up this evening. And thank you again for coming. Bye.